How to make an economizer, a condenser and water tank combination. An economizer, as part of a steam plant, is used to preheat the water before it's pumped into the boiler. My logic tells me that the condenser gets hot as the steam from the exhaust passes through it and the water is cold. So if I mount them on a common brass base, then the heat from one will warm the other. This is a feature length episode, it's over 20 minutes in duration. These are all extracts from a video series that I made a while back about building a steam plant using three Cotswold Heritage engines. This opening sequence shows me cutting the copper tubing in real time. A quick health and safety warning to start with, please do not fall into a coma whilst watching this. The real video starts here and I hope you enjoy it. When cutting tubing on a bandsaw like this, which is not very rigid, it's a good idea to support the arm. The arm on this bandsaw is sort of adjustable by altering the tension of a spring, but really it's not enough, so I'm supporting this with my hand and controlling how quickly the bandsaw blade cuts through the piece of copper tubing. If I just leave the bandsaw to its own devices and put the blade on top of the metal, the blade will tend to wander about and the cut will not be very square. As you can clearly see in this clip, I keep retracting the blade altogether, and by doing this, I finally get a really nice square cut piece of copper tubing. And the first one's already done, here it goes. And in this part of the clip, I'm using the first piece to help set the position of the copper tube to cut the second piece. I can't remember where this piece of copper tube came from. It's been in the workshop for quite a long time, obviously just sat there waiting to be used in the steam plant. It has some paint on it and it's a bit marked in places, but it really doesn't matter because it's going to be cleaned up and painted black anyway to match the boiler. This bandsaw sequence is not running in real time, it's at twice normal speed and in no time at all the second piece is cut. And here are the two pieces sat on the bench, still warm from the cutting process and a bit rough around the edges. One of these pieces of copper tube will form the condenser oil trap and the other one will be the water tank. I think they're about the right height, they look okay. I'm just trying to figure out how far away they should be from each other. Normally, I put pieces of copper tube like this into the chuck of the larger of my two lathes and turn the end square. But if I put this piece of copper tubing in the forge or self-centering chuck that is fitted to the larger of my two lathes, it's still not going to work. It would be sticking out too far from the chuck, and the minute I applied the cutting tool, everything would go very wrong. There are two or three techniques that you could employ that would make it feasible. You could use a thing called a fixed steady. The steady clamps to the lathe bed and is used for supporting the part of the work that's the furthest from the chuck. Or I could turn a large steel mandrel that fits inside the copper tube and goes into the chuck. Or even turn up a wooden plug to fit in the outer part of the copper tube, which could be centre drilled and then supported by the tailstock live centre. But after all that, the quickest method is definitely to use a belt sander like you've seen me do. By using a set square to frequently check the squareness of the end, it's surprising how accurate you can actually get it. And the only reason that I have the copper tubing in the lathe is just to illustrate how close it is to being square, and I didn't take any serious cuts. This very useful gadget is called a deburring tool, because it's used for deburring pieces of metal like this. You just run the blade round the inside edge of the hole or opening, and it removes any burrs. You can use it for removing burrs from very small drilled holes as well. They really aren't very expensive, and they're an essential workshop tool to make the job easier. So here are the two pieces of copper tubing with the ends cleaned up, and they're both exactly the same length. And now by using the lathe, it's time to clean up the outside. A health and safety warning, this can be very dangerous if you don't do it right. This is a long piece of emery cloth, and my hands are nowhere near the chuck jaws. It looks like my hands are close to the work, but they're not, it's just the camera angle. It is vital that you do not hold onto the ends of the emery cloth too tightly. Just hold it lightly, that way if it does catch up in the chuck, it pulls it out of your hands and doesn't pull your hand into the work. As I clean up the copper tube, I notice there's a bit of a dint on this one, but luckily it is in exactly the same place where I'm going to put the water fitting. And after being very grateful for having such luck, I turn my attention to the other piece of tubing. The process is exactly the same as for the first piece and once again I'm holding the piece of emery cloth very lightly. In no time at all the job is completed, and with all of my fingers still intact I'm using a piece of Scotch-Brite to further clean up the outside of the two pieces of copper tubing. 
As I mentioned earlier, the dinted part of the tube is exactly where I need it to be. When I lift the copper tubing off the bench to simulate the thickness of the base, you will see that it's just about the same height as the union on the inlet to the pump. So now it's over to the drilling machine to drill the holes in the copper tubing, and here is a very rare sight of me actually using a vacuum cleaner to clean up my machine tools. I'm drilling a hole in the piece of copper tubing, which is two imperial sizes down from 5 sixteenths of an inch, which is 9 30 seconds of an inch, and here I'm using an ME 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch tap to cut the thread in the copper. And in case you've never seen any of my videos before, ME stands for Model Engineering. That was the water tank, and this one is the condenser, and I'm drilling this hole nearer to the edge of the copper tube, after which I thread it in the same way. Once again, it's an ME 5 sixteenths by 32 threads per inch tap. I don't normally write on the copper tubing, I've just done it for the video. One of them says T for tank, and the other says C for condenser. It's time to screw the brass union fittings into the side of the copper tubing. Now I'm going to make the base. Don't take any notice of the felt tip pen line, I'm using the guide on the bandsaw to cut it squarely. So here's the plan, I'm going to mount both the condenser and the water tank on a common brass base. And the idea of this is so that the heat from the condenser will travel along the metal base into the water tank and warm up the water. I need to drill a mounting hole in each of the four corners of the base. I've made a mark with a felt tip pen where I want the hole to be. Once I've drilled the first hole, all I do is drill the rest because I'm using a jig. This piece of wood clamped in the machine vise with a piece of metal does the trick. As I turn the brass sheet over, the hole is always in the same position. And this is what it looks like when I round the edges. And here are the two copper tubes in the approximate position on the brass sheet base. This is a piece of one inch diameter copper tube from which I will make the condenser chimney. This clip is a bit self-indulgent and playing past the parcel without actually having to pass the parcel to anyone else. And look what's inside. Two very nicely cut pieces of aluminium, three inches in diameter and five eighths of an inch thick. And I'm going to use these to make the top caps for the condenser and the water tank. Why use aluminium? Well, the top of the boiler's aluminium, so they will all match. And once the copper parts are painted black to match the boiler, I think the overall visual effect will be quite good. On some plants it's okay to leave the water tanks in copper, but in this case they need to be black. To start the machining operation I'm using the tailstock chuck to position the blank in the forge or chuck. I'm using my old Smart & Brown 1024 lathe, which is the larger of the two lathes that I have, mainly because this blank will not fit in the three jaw chuck on my Boxford lathe, and unfortunately I do not have any outside jaws for that chuck. The first part of the job is to take a facing cut across the aluminium bar. Once I'd faced the aluminium bar stock, because I was cutting on the outside edge I slowed the lathe down. And this is the part of the aluminium cap that fits into the copper part, so I need to turn this to an accurate fit. It needs to be a smooth push fit into the top of the copper, not too tight and not too slack. Please insert a girlfriend joke here. This particular cutting tool does not really cut very well on a left hand cut, but it cuts very well on a right hand cut. So I'm just pulling it back towards the right and I get a good finish. The question is now, does this cap fit in the copper tube? I will try it. This piece of copper tubing is not the condenser. It's the water tank, but it's the same size, so it's okay as a gauge. In this clip, I'm using a file to remove the sharp edge. And please note, whenever you file in the lathe, make sure the file has a substantial handle. Time to fit the component the other way around in the chuck, and I'm using a soft hammer just to seat it and make sure it's square with the jaws. And once again, the first thing to do is to take a facing cut across the front of the work. This top cap is for the condenser, and it needs to be machined to look just about the same as the one on the top of the boiler, except smaller. You may have noticed that I keep squirting the aluminium with something. This is WD-40. Paraffin, or WD-40, or white spirit, is the best cutting lubricant I've found for aluminium. I'm using WD-40 because it's conveniently in an aerosol can. Time now to first of all centre drill the piece of aluminium and drill through it a couple of drill sizes below one inch. And that is because if I drilled the hole all the way through using a one inch drill, apart from the fact that the tube would be a bit of a rattle fit, it would fall all the way through into the condenser. I'm now using a boring tool part of the way through the aluminium to make it the correct size to be a snug fit for the chimney tube. 
That's not the lathe wobbling, by the way. I've just kicked the tripod, as it's very close to where I'm working. Time for another test fit using the copper tubing, and yes, it's very nearly there. So I set the hand wheel to two thousandths of an inch. But don't forget, when you set the hand wheel to two thou, it will actually remove four thou from the hole. The final test fit using the copper pipe confirms that the hole's the right size. So that's the inside done, now it's time to turn the outside. Plenty of lubricant and a very sharp cutting tool is the order of the day. I need to get a good finish on this component. I almost forgot what I need to do with this component. Using a milling cutter in the milling machine is mill a deep slot and this will clear the fitting in the copper tube. The steam inlet union on the condenser needs to be as near the top as possible. But I also need to leave a generous amount of metal on the top cap so that it pushes firmly into the copper tank. In this clip I put the part in place so you can see the effect of what it's going to be like. I will shorten the chimney tube to be at the same height as the boiler chimney and I will also make a brass ring just like the one on the boiler to fit around the top. Time now to make the cap for the water tank. More or less the same procedure so I'm not going to labour the point by showing every step. The main difference between this part and the previous one is that this top cap doesn't have a big hole in the middle and it doesn't need to be a tight fit on the copper tank. So here are the finished items. I've only just started the polishing process, there's a bit more to do yet. But I think they look okay, and when you look at them at the side of the boiler, they're quite a good match. I've added this. It's a bush to allow me to fit a drain tap to drain the condensate at the end of a run. Now that the brass and copper parts are very clean, I can solder them together. Whenever you solder parts together, whether it be silver soldering or soft soldering, absolute cleanliness of the parts is vital and it's also quite important to use this stuff. This is flux soldering paste. It's the kind of stuff you buy from a DIY store, and once this is applied to the work and heated up, it cleans the metal. I'm applying plenty of this because I do not want any areas where there isn't any flux. I'm going to use plumber's solder to solder these components onto this metal plate, and unlike electrical solder, plumber's solder does not contain any flux built in. I can't really show much of the soldering process because it all takes place down inside the tubes and I really don't want to melt my new camera. The good thing is, because these are going to be painted, it doesn't matter if I get some solder on the brass base. If I was going to polish up this base, like on some condensers that I make, then I'd have to be very careful, but in this case it really is not important because I'll be sanding off most of the solder that's on the base as I key it for the paint. You will notice that in this clip I'm using the paintbrush a lot because I need to remove the excess solder from around the base of the tubes. I just dip the brush in some water and brush away the excess solder. While the condenser and water tank assembly is cooling, I think I'll make the ring for the top of the chimney. And for this, I'm using a scrap piece of brass that I found in the drawer. I've no idea where this part came from in the first place, but it's ideal for making the chimney top cap. I'm shaping this part completely manually by winding the two handles on the top slide at the same time. And now, as always, it's time to use the centre drill to make a hole in the centre of the work. The next part of the job is to drill a hole all the way through the piece. And luckily, this is like a cap, so I don't have to drill very far, as you can see. This is a couple of drill sizes under the one inch that I require. In this clip I'm comparing it with the original chimney from the boiler. And now I'm using a file in the lathe to shape the ring. Time for a couple of health and safety warnings. The first one is, when using a file in the lathe, make sure it has a handle. This is very important. And you will notice if you look closely at this clip, I'm always putting a bias on the file away from the chuck. So if it slips, it comes towards me and not towards the chuck. It's common sense really. Now I'm using a piece of folded emery cloth to remove the scratches that are left by the file and once again I fold the emery cloth many times and you will notice that I never put my fingers on the work itself. Similarly with this long piece of wet dry sandpaper my fingers are miles away from the work. And I'm pleased to announce that I still have at least five of my fingers left after all these years of doing jobs like this. Once I stop the lathe, I can feel now that this part is quite smooth. It's time to start the boring process, and yes, it is fairly boring if you do it a lot. 
What I'm doing is boring the hole to exactly the right size so I can push in this piece of copper. The idea is to take a very small amount of metal from the inside of the tube and then frequently check the fit using the copper chimney. It's miles off yet, I'm just being a bit pedantic just so I can make a video about it. I'm taking a very small amount off each time. I want the ring to be a very tight push fit on the copper so I don't have to silver solder it in place. If I was going to silver solder it in place, I'd need it to be a slack fit so that the silver solder could penetrate the joint. But this one is a push fit, and when I finally get it to the right size, I use the tailstock to push the piece of copper tubing into the brass fitting, after which I part off the entire assembly. Sometimes I've seen people do this, holding the part with the hand because eventually it's going to stop spinning, but I never do that. Instead, I'm using a piece of brass hexagon in the end of the tube so that when it parts off, I can just lift it out of the way. With the parted off chimney clamped in the chuck of my Smart and Brown lathe, which is a good bit bigger than the Boxford, I'm facing off the part where the top edge of the copper meets the brass ring. I couldn't really do this on the Boxford because the hole in the spindle is too small. And now it's clean up time. The component that I soldered earlier has cooled, and so it's on the bench and it's time to give it a really good scouring. First of all with emery cloth, I need to scratch the brass as much as possible. But then once I've scratched the brass as much as possible, I need to smooth out some of the scratches and make finer scratches using Scotch-Brite. And just in case you've never seen any of my other videos, Scotch-Brite is an abrasive pad, a bit like a scouring pad, but a bit more vicious. I'll put the spelling on screen so you can get some for yourself. I use this stuff very frequently in my workshop for cleaning up metal parts as you see here and also getting a good finish on machine parts. But don't just take my word for it, try it for yourself. This clip shows the chimney and I've polished up the brass ring on my polishing spindle. But the polishing spindle has also polished up part of the copper and I don't want this to be polished, it needs to be keyed for the paint. So once again I'm using the Scotch Brite to do this. And I'm spraying the parts using some etch primer. The etch primer I'm using is Precision Paints etch primer. I really do like this stuff and best of all, it works. Provided you follow the instructions, you must be able to see the metal through the paint. And if you look carefully, you can see the metal through the paint. This means that the etch primer gets plenty of oxygen to do its job. Or at least I assume that's what the reason is. And the instruction leaflet that comes with this etch primer tells me to wait 24 hours before overcoating. So I'm waiting 24 hours. Now it's time to give them the first coat of the black paint. And you will notice that I'm moving the parts frequently and applying light coats. This seems to be the best way to spray paint. If you put one big thick heavy coat on, apart from it's going to run and look terrible, it's not the best way to do it. And also by applying a thick coat, too much solvent can attack the paint underneath. So as you've just seen, first of all I paint the chimney, then I paint the tanks, then I go back and give the chimney a second coat, then shortly afterwards I return to the condenser and the water tank assembly and give that a second coat. And then all I need to do is just let the paint dry. This is satin black paint and the one problem with satin black is that it varies in how satin it is. I painted this yesterday with some satin black but the satin black is a little bit too shiny. Luckily I have some other satin black that's not so shiny. Aesthetically it's quite important that the tank assembly matches the boiler. Before overcoating though, I'm giving this a rub down. And I'm using 400 grit wet or dry sandpaper and then I'm wiping it over with this stuff, it's called panel wipe. This will remove any residue from the sanding process. I'm now in the outer part of the workshop, right by a wide open garage door. The paint I'm using is HMG Satin Black. This is really good quality paint and it gives a brilliant, almost matte finish. Not quite though, it's satin, but it's more matte than satin if you see what I mean. To shorten the sequence, I've speeded up the video considerably, but as you can see, I'm putting fairly thin coats on, but a lot of them. Now I need to allow some time to elapse for the paint to dry, so it's back into the workshop to fit the boiler. And here is the tank assembly in its approximate position on the baseboard. And you can clearly see from this clip that it's a good match for the paint on the boiler. I'd just like to mention something about the aluminium top caps on the boiler and the tanks that I made. 
quite a few of my more meticulous than usual type of viewers took the trouble to write in to tell me all about the cathodic corrosion problem with aluminium and copper. I'm not entirely stupid, so I am aware of this. But look at the boiler cap. That's made by Cotswold Heritage, and they seem to think it's fine to use a piece of aluminium for the top of the boiler. I just wanted to match the aluminium cap. Apart from being a fully working model, this steam plant will be a display piece, so it will spend most of its life in a very warm environment, a very warm and dry environment, so the absence of an electrolyte will mean that cathodic corrosion will not take place. The three-engine Cotswold Heritage steam plant is now complete. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.